Good afternoon. I'm Ted Fernales. I am on the product management team also that manages our wireless line product line. Um, so welcome to the 40 Guru session of the of this uh, of this uh, day. Um, I guess um, most of you have heard about single channel architecture, right? And, and um, I think um, like other folks that we've heard from our customers, um, they always ask, you know, how does it actually work? Because they're all used to um, designing their wireless networks with a multi-channel architecture, and this is a little different. So I'm going to try to spend a few minutes to try to help you um, get more detail on how the uh, single channel architecture, or what we also call uh, virtual cell, work in, in your network. Can I ask real quick, uh, just, just to get a, full, a clear understanding on this, uh, is, is uh, the single channel architecture something that Fortinet sees continuing in, in, in the long term? Is this still the, the direction? Um, because I believe there is also some, some multi-channel architecture available as well. Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for asking that. That's also a common question we get after the uh, acquisition from, from Fortinet. So, um, yeah, so if you uh, remember what Karosh was talking about with the three types of products that we have, the cloud, FortiGate, and the uh, dedicated controller. So single channel architecture is part of that the dedicated controller product line. So the Maru product line in the past remains intact. That's part of the offering. And uh, single channel is continues to be part of that, part of that solution. So yes, it, uh, it'll, it'll still live on. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and a, uh, I guess a little quick background um, with Maru. So Maru developed and brought single channel uh, architecture to the market. Um, prior to the acquisition, uh, we probably had about 12,000 customers using uh, uh, the virtual cell uh, uh, solution, and um, uh, the type of customers that uh, we uh, normally fit into are the schools, like uh, one of you here has a big school using our stuff. Um, we have a large uh, school down in Florida, Miami-Dade uh, uh, Public County School System. They have about 16,000 of our APs running the network, so it's a, it's a large scale uh, solution that, uh, that we provide. Um, it also works well in really RF, um, RF uh, a challenging environments. So for example, stadiums. Um, any baseball fans uh, here? Uh, so the Red Sox, Boo. Um, Fenway Park. <laughs> Fenway Park is one of our customers. So they, they run the uh, uh, virtual cell architecture there. Um, football season just started. Um, Heinz Field, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, they also use the, uh, the um, dedicated controller uh, solution in their network. And uh, we're also finding that a lot of the uh, Manufacturing um, the sites like Virtual Cell because of its uh, uh, great uh, suitability for RF, RF, you know, challenging environments like uh, Toyota in Japan. They actually use it on their manufacturing floor. Uh, another one is um, Sony, Nintendo, in Japan. They also use that on manufacturing. So you know, it's a kind of interesting um, a view on you know where this is fitting well, not only just on scale, but because of the the way we handle RF, and we'll, we'll talk about that in uh, in a little bit. How many minutes do we have left, Chris? Ten. <laughs> Ten, okay. I'll, I'll talk faster. So in a nutshell, I think I can go quickly through this. Um, what virtual cell really is, um, is that you have all our APs, right, in your network. They're all operating on the same channel. And apart from that, they're also transmitting the same BSID out to the clients. And what that really means is that um, from the station's point of view, you, it, it, it actually sees really just one AP. So in, in our terms of virtual AP. Um, one, one common question we get with, vir with virtual cell, since it, it's kind of different from microchannel, right? If it's standards based. And the answer is yes, obviously. Um, any .NET 11 you know, certified client will work in, in a, a single channel architecture environment. So you know, how does it actually uh, operate uh, maybe differently? So because the uh, controller has visibility across uh, your network, so it has a global view. Um, it actually uh, looks at the RSA, RSA values that the clients are experiencing as they you know, access and get serviced by the network. So if it deems that you know, the RSA value for one of them starts getting low and he sees another access point that could be a better uh, fit to service that, the client, he actually, um, we call it seamlessly handed, handed off to that next best AP. So we don't actually have the, the roaming that you normally have where the client is actually controlling uh, when to go to another access point uh, in your network.
All right, so that's kind of the basics. So let's talk about a little more detail how uh, uh, single channel architecture uh, uh, works. So you know, when we, if you think about the the challenge here, you, know, you have access points all running, talking the same channel. So it, you would think you, you see a lot of uh, a lot of contention between uh, these a APs as they operate. So uh, the way that uh, we looked at is we looked at two areas that you have to address in order for this thing to work. So one is uh, trying to handle co-channel interference, right? A lot of APs running the same channel, a lot of noise, they're all fighting each other. So we gotta figure a way to how to address that and uh, mitigate and really just in the baseline, minimize uh, collisions with, with clients. So you can still have a decent amount of, uh, of uh, channel utilization, right? Uh, as you offer services to the clients. I'll, I'll get into details in the next few slides. So and the second uh, key area is uh, how to maximize channel reuse. So if you think about it, you know, uh, since all these APs are talking the same uh, channel, um, you would think that uh, you can only allow one client to talk at, this, you know, at one time when um, everyone's on the same channel. But uh, in reality, you know, it, each AP actually is working as a standalone um, access point. So it's not really a shared Mac or a, or a big Mac where you have a bunch of radios and, and one process looking at Mac. So we'll talk about how we actually allow this in, uh, in the single channel environment. All right, so uh, if we're free to go to talk about how we minimize contention, I need to do a quick review, or you probably don't need one, but I need to mention how, uh, how we address this. We basically use the, I, the WMM access control spec to, uh, to allow or to minimize collisions in our network and allow us to uh, um, minimize um, uh, contention. So you know, as a quick review, uh, as, as you know, the client, before it even joins the network, it, it makes sure that the, the airspace is free. Um, if it is free, then there's this uh, value called interface spacing where it waits, right? And then you have this uh, back off timer uh, that he has to pick um, randomly from um, as an additional wait time. And once it's free, then he starts transmitting, right? And before he can deem it a success, you have to see the acknowledgement from the receiver in order for him to say, you know, he had a successful, successful transmission. So I guess if you think about it, if, uh, if you have um, a low number of clients, then this CWMN value um, is also low, right? So it's a, you have a shorter wait time um, as you uh, service, service these clients. So um, you would have obviously a, good, a better performance because you have enough time to switch from one client to another as he transmits and, and gets serviced by the access point. But as you get more and more clients, right, if this thing starts going to, you know, let's say, infinity, right, then you'll be waiting for a long, long time um, in order for you to give, uh, give, uh, give uh, turns to each of the clients on your access point. So the, the key here really is to figure out you know, um, how to determine this contention window right, that you can maximize over the air time and also reduce the amount of loss. And um, what we've discovered uh, during the Maru days is that what we needed to do was to effectively estimate the number of instantaneous clients on your network. So there's the difference between clients on the AP, right, versus uh, instantaneous clients on the AP. You know, a web, you know, five clients doing web traffic on, on an AP aren't necessarily always, you know, getting uh, requested service from the access point. So we found a way to basically um, estimate the number of instantaneous contenders when we make that WM calculation. So that gave us the way to actually service, allows, allow, uh, allow us to service clients in a uh, pretty optimized manner and try to avoid these collisions. So yes, that works well on a single AP, right? That, that's another challenge that other uh, AP uh, vendors have. So the question is, how do you actually address that when you have lots of APs uh, trying to contend all on the same channel? So how do you, uh, how you do that? So um, basically for, for two APs, what you have to remember now is that you're not just looking at the load on one AP anymore, right? You also have to look and take consideration now the load that's being generated by your neighboring AP. So now you have a combination of clients that you have to address as part of this whole um, calculation. So what we've done was we actually created um, a way to table all of the AP loads on your, on your network and basically make that a way to get calculated 
and advertised to a certain AP that needs to transmit. So I'll, I'll try to kind of simplify that here. If uh, AP load that's running on this AP is four stations, right? Um, and its neighbor also has one. Instead of just calculating your WM values based on four, the controller has to now say, okay, you, have, you use four plus that one station that's in your neighboring uh, access point. Um, so the load gets distributed uh, based on that, that total. There is a big calculation that's get, that, that gets done. It's a, really a function that um, I'm probably not, not even capable of, of explaining to you guys, but that, that's how we uh, allow us to, uh, to uh, offer the load of your neighbor as part of the whole calculation for uh, that access point. So um, a good example is the opposite of this. If you had one you know, client on this, state, on this AP, um, right next to an AP that's four, Obviously, in a, normal, in a normal scenario, you'd only have a contention window of one, right? And if, if you didn't have this uh, running, then you would be starving all the other four in your network. So because of we're adding the, the uh, load that's being seen on this access point, it now becomes uh, literally almost like looking at five stations with, with, a, with a, obviously another, uh, other values to uh, make as part of your WM calculation. So yeah, so based on that, it gets fed into um, the way we find out what the instantiation clients are, and once that is done, then you create the you, you calculate the WM parameters, and that gets fed into your uh, beacons and gets sent out to the clients. Any questions on this? All right. Come on, are you serious? <laughs> There's no questions. No questions. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> I asked for it. How do you know which clients have something to talk? Yeah, so um, every, every AP is responsible for sending the load to the controller. And I'll also talk later that, on that's, with... That's clients associated. How do you know they want to talk? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about later on in the next section, how we do max reuse. It'll be combined with this to uh, determine which, which, which those are, are ready to get transmitted. I can wait. A minute and a half. A minute and a half. We're almost there. <laughs> I'm sorry, any more questions on that? Okay. So the other part of that uh, challenge was to figure out how to allow for maximum um, channel reuse, right? So obviously the, the, cha the challenge here is, you know, how do you allow um, clients that are in neighboring APs to be able to talk uh, without having them to wait for the one next to them? Um, in this case, you know, obviously one and two could talk because these two APs are far apart enough that they don't hear each other and that will work um, uh, fine, and, uh, fine, and, uh, fine and dandy. The, the real question is, you know, how do you handle the scenario where you have their APs are close enough, right, where the AP can, APA can kind of hear APB in this scenario. So you actually want to try to find a way to transmit to station one, even though you hear something that's going on with uh, access point B. So that's one and two. For, for three and four, obviously those are too close and the uh, signal to weight ratio is probably almost the same. So those will definitely collide and you can't really do anything about uh, those two stations. So the question is, how do you help maximize the use of the channels by allowing this scenario to, to happen? I'm just gonna go to the next uh, bullet there to head it all out. So, so basically what we do is we, um, so I talked about that table a while ago that uh, collects all the AP load info. Um, additional piece of info we actually add also in this table is each device's uh, uh, signal strength, which kind of determines really where that station is in your circle, right? So I've, I've drawn three regions here. Um, so you can have stations uh, based on the blue region, blue zone. Uh, stations on the green zone and also stations on the red zone, right? Uh, based on those values. So, what what happens here? Um, I mean, again, te technically, again, if an AP is getting, if he knows he needs to talk to someone in the blue region, right, and uh, he's hearing some noise from here on on on, on AP on the right, um, he'll probably have a hard time servicing this because he thinks he's going to. Uh, basically collide with the other guy. Um, so what you have to try to do is try to find a way to ignore that access point. And I, I, I kind of uh, 
related to when you're in a restaurant, maybe when you're at having dinner last night, right? You know, you're talking to someone in your table, and obviously there's other conversations going on, and you could probably obviously talk to the guy next to you, with even though you're still hearing someone in, in the next, you know, three or four uh, uh, tables down. So that's what we try to do here. So, in the, for example, for the blue zone, if we know that the client is in this region, and the ceiling to noise ratio or the ceiling strength here is strong enough uh, that he won't, he knows he won't disturb ABB. He'll actually um, ignore it. We, we call it deafing the the AP um, in order him to, in order for him to transmit. So this yes. has been brought up before by others. Okay. How similar that is to RxSOP. Okay. Yeah. And I think someone also asked uh, the other day. It's similar to I think uh, uh, BSS coloring, but. Uh, um, I mean, similar concept. I mean, the whole, the whole. Uh, I mean, this was done again six, seven years, eight, nine years ago, I think, um, when it first came out. So it was pretty uh, innovative back then. Uh, but it, it's it's really trying to get the measurements right of the clients, and being able to react, and 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 and, and tell the APs how to service them, when all this info is you know being calculated and, and collected by the controller. So that's really the the uh, the challenge, um, because if you have you know, fifty APs. Still manageable, but you know you have a, uh, you know, 100, 200 APs now in the controller. A little bigger, bigger challenge on, on being able to handle that. So, you know, we. I have a question. Okay. Because I get your like you're deafening around those areas, but what happens to the people in those areas? That it's. I mean, you that that seems like you you have lots of dead spots. You're meaning you here? In like this right in the middle there. Yeah, we're not gonna. We don't deafen. So we're saying that uh, in the blue and green zones, we'll allow it to happen, whereas in the red, we're we're gonna you know still uh, not let, not let them transmit at that point of time. So again, it's remember it's a it's an instantaneous snapshot and and trying to figure out who goes next, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else? So uh, hopefully, <laughs> I've uh, kind of simplified the way uh, signals channel works. Um, I guess I just want to quick close by saying that you know, obviously it's standards based. I get a lot of questions from the field saying, "Hey, this looks smells a little different, but it, it's the same. It only operates in the channel." We've handled uh, as as I've gone through the prior slides, we, we, um, we taught you how we handle those scenarios. And um, as, as to your point a while ago about uh, multi-channel, you know, signals channel is just a tool, you know, in the toolbox. Um, the controller product line, you know, offers both single and multi-channel, with all the tools that you do for, you know, um, channel um, channel assignments, auto channel assignments, and, and radio uh, radio assignments for the MCA part. So, depending who the customer or what the customer is more familiar with, we can support either either or. And uh, the last bullet, just want to make sure you guys uh, are understand it is part of our um, our uh, our. Um, uh, standalone controller solution and it'll be part of that solution as we as we move forward 11ax and, and beyond